Lecture 21 Hero Myths In this lecture, we begin a new unit. Uh, this is our unit about heroes and about heroic myths, um, and it includes some very good stories. Um, we'll start off by defining the hero and then uh, describe what we mean by heroic myths. And then we'll have to talk a little bit about the monomyth, that idea that there's a kind of universal hero story with common elements that transcend cultural definitions. And then we'll break that monomyth up into manageable units, illustrating with some myths that we've already done and others with which you're probably familiar. And then we'll conclude by taking a brief look at the familiar myth of Heracles to try out the ideas that we have introduced in this lecture. The hero is always larger than life. That's the root meaning of the word in Greek, larger than life, who does things that most of the rest of us can't do. He may also serve as a model for us, giving us deeds to emulate. Moses Hadass, in a book called Introduction to Classical Drama, says that the hero always pushes back the horizons of what is possible for man. And I think that's a good place to start. Um, every time there's a hero, a hero makes us feel a little more proud of being humans because he's redefined human nature in a slightly larger way. The extraordinary powers that a hero has can be accounted for in various ways in myths. Some of them are literally gods, as Prometheus is, for example, in a Greek myth. Many of them are part god and part human. That is, usually they have one divine and one human parent. Achilles is like this, Aeneas is like this, but so are Jesus and Buddha and quite a few Native American heroes, uh, one divine, one um, mortal parent. Some heroes are purely human, who still manage to do things that we didn't think were possible. Odysseus um, in Homer's Odyssey is an example of that kind of hero. In the modern age, we have desacralized the hero. That is, we no longer consider the hero to be part divine, and he's no longer sacred, um, purely human. There are no more divine parents in most of our heroes in our day, but some of our heroes still have some of the superhuman powers of the classical hero. Think of Superman, for example, who has fan fantastic strength and can fly. All heroes are connected to the cultures from which they arise making them all, in some ways, culture heroes, an idea we've already encountered before. A culture hero is one who helps to arrange the world in which we live. Um, he may help with the actual creation of the cosmos, or may bring humans some skill or technique, like metalworking or agriculture, or may help to decide how society should be arranged, work out who can marry whom, or what initiation ceremony should be like or bring a body of laws or certain ceremonies, the way the white buffalo woman in Lecture 13 taught the Sioux the pipe ceremonies. In Lecture 10, we remember the Chinese Yu helps create the world for agriculture by stopping the flood. And in Lecture 17, the Ojibwe once brings the gift of corn to his people. As culture, cultural heroes are all intimately connected to the cultures from which they come, so that, for example, there are many myths in Native American and Mesoamerican cultures that feature corn, since that's a staple crop for all of them. In Malaya, the Shewang people, who are a hunting and gathering group, have a, have a culture hero who teaches people how to share food and, how, and teaches women how to give birth and how to breastfeed babies without destroying themselves in the process. Prometheus brings fire to humans. Moses, Muhammad, and King Arthur all bring to their people the specific gifts that they need to survive. Our own culture has heroes like Rambo and the protagonist of the Die Hard series, which suggests that they must reflect in some way some of our cultural values, otherwise we wouldn't consider them as heroes. There are some other kinds of heroes that are connected with the establishment of states or dynasties. Theseus is that kind of hero in Athens. He's a ruler and a founder of most of the institutions that defined democracy for Athens in later times. Romulus and Aeneas are that kind of hero for Rome, establishing first the city and then the state, and then setting it on a course that would lead to domination of much of the known world in the time of the empire. The Chinese Yu, in Lecture 10, was the founder of the mythical Shia dynasty, and King Arthur serves as some of the same functions, in some of the same functions, first for the Celts and then later for the English. 
But despite the fact that all myths have to reflect values specific to the culture which creates them, it is impossible not to notice that myths of different cultures share motifs and themes and characters and narrative structures which has led scholars over the past 150 years to search for something which they call the monomyth. A monomyth is a story which is shared by all cultures and peoples in a way that necessarily transcends individual cultures. Joseph Campbell, who's one of the great proponents of the idea of the monomyth, says this about the hero in his most famous book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The hero, therefore, is the man or woman who has been able to battle past his personal and local historical limitations to the generally valid, normally human forms. And notice what his definition is, to, to battle past the personal and local, that is the culturally defined, and to achieve some kind of generally valid, normally human forms, that is to achieve some kind of universality. The search for a monomyth goes back at least 1871 when an English anthropologist named E.B. Taylor wrote a book called Primitive Culture in which he noticed how many hero myths follow the same pattern. A hero is exposed at birth, is saved by other humans or animals, and then grows up to become a national hero. Otto Rank, uh, who was a disciple of Freud but who later broke with his teacher, in 1909 wrote a book called The Myth of the Birth of the Hero, and he added some elements to Taylor's list. According to the story as uh, it's captured or summarized by Rank, most heroes are born to distinguished parents. In older myths, that means they're usually born to king or queens, kings or queens. During pregnancy, a prophecy warns the parents, usually the father, that the child will be a danger to its father, so after birth, the child is exposed. It's left out on the mountainside, it is abandoned in a forest, hoping that wild animals will find it and destroy it. However, it isn't destroyed. The child is found by animals and raised by animals or found by other human beings who also raise it. When the child grows up, he finds his real parents and after a series of adventures, he avenges himself on his father, and then he achieves his true place in society. Lord Raglan, in a, who was an ally of Sir James Fraser of the Golden Bough fame, in 1936 published a book called The Hero, which went on from Ronk's description, and he listed 22 separate steps in the hero's life from birth to death. Joseph Campbell, in 1949, built on the work of these scholars in his The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And he divided his monomyth into three stages. The first is the stage of separation or departure from the comfortable world in which one lives. Then, having left the comfortable world, there are trials and obstacles on the way, including all kinds of temptations and conflicts. And then at the end, after the adventure is done, a boon has been uh, won, um, there is the return in which the hero brings back that boon to transform the world from which he departed. Campbell went on to divide each of those three parts into parts themselves so that the first stage, which is separation or departure, includes for him the call to adventure, which can come in many different ways. How do I know I'm being called to leave my comfortable life? The refusal of the call, which is something that a hero can always do, he can say, nope, I'm not going to answer that call, I'm going to stay right where I am. Having accepted the call, there's usually some supernatural aid that comes to his rescue, and then he has to cross the first threshold. The first threshold being the transition from this world, the one I live in, into the world of my adventure. Then there comes a section called In the Belly of the Whale, and that one is uh, usually a stage in which a hero metaphorically dies, um, gets swallowed up so that the old life disappears in preparation for rebirth. Um, that's the structure that we took a, a brief look at when we were talking about the Harry Potter series back in Lecture 2. Each of Campbell's other stages is similarly divided. Now, not all students of myth agree with Campbell's structure nor even with the idea that there is such a thing as a monomyth. But it has been a rich point of departure for discussion for half a century, whether one agrees with it or not. Another point to be made about these monomyths, these particular monomyths, is the fact that, as we said, the hero in the 20th century has been desacralized. So the basis for most monomyth theories turns out to be psychological rather than religious or metaphysical. And this is especially true of the work of Ronk and Campbell. 
Ronk found the origins of myths in the, what he called the family romance, which always begins with a child idealizing his parents and then becoming disillusioned with them. Eventually he comes to think of himself as the son of different parents, usually higher born than the people he lived with, lives with, and, but that he was somehow lost or abandoned as an infant and thus winds up with the people that he lives with now. The relationship with the father for Ronk is complicated by feelings of sexual, sexual jealousy over access to the mother, and eventually the child imagines his parents disappearing altogether. But the child still harbors affection for his parents, and so he arranges all of this in fantasy. That is, he makes up stories, he makes up myths about this situation. And, and the stories that he makes up become Ronk, Ronk's monomyth, in which the child of distinguished parents, who are warned about the dangers of this child, abandon it where it's rescued by peasants or by animals. When the child grows up, he finds his parents. He takes revenge on his father, he either kills him or is acknowledged by him, and then he's raised in honor and status back to where he should have been all along. For Ronk, this is simply part of growing up. It's inventing heroes is one of the ways that a child deals with his powerlessness in the family. It involves processes like projection, that is the son's hostility toward the father in the myth becomes the father's hostility toward the son. And this again we noticed about um, when we talked about the, the, uh, the, the Harry Potter series back in lecture two. Children of course don't create myths, but when adults do, they incorporate into them universal anxieties according to Ronk. We overcome those anxieties by idealizing ourselves in the person of the hero. And we distance ourselves from the anxieties, after all we still love our parents, by putting all of this into the realm of fantasy rather than acting any of these out. So that for Ronk, the family romance is a complicated combination of love and anger and rejection and jealousy and admiration and disillusionment. All of this becomes the family romance which for him is the basis of the myth of the hero. Joseph Campbell relied on the work of Ronk as well as on the work of Freud and Raglan and others, but perhaps the most important insights for Campbell came from Carl Jung, who also had been a one-time pupil of Freud, who like Ronk later broke away from his teacher. Like Freud, Jung believed in the importance of the unconscious in the total makeup of the psyche. But Freud saw the contents of the unconscious as repressed infantile impulses where, where Jung saw them as made up of what he called the collective unconscious, which we share with people in all times and places, regardless of our culture and the experiences we have in growing up. For Freud, for example, a boy's sexual feelings for his mother and hostility toward his father as a competitor for the mother's affection have to be suppressed because they can't be acted out. When they're suppressed, they sink below the level of consciousness so that later they can influence our behavior, but we can't know why we're feeling or doing what we are since the conscious mind has no direct access to the unconscious where such impulses are always buried. Jung believed in a collective unconscious which we share with all other human beings. That is, for Jung, the contents of the unconscious are not simply personal. Um, it, it, other critics have said about Jung's theory of the unconscious that it can be compared to our capacity for language. No child is born able to speak any language, but we're all born with the capacity to learn one. It's a kind of hard wiring that allows us to speak and understand speech. Whether we learn Chinese or Norwegian or English depends on the culture into which we're born. But there does seem to be a kind of shared structure of language which allows us to learn one and maybe even more than one and to be able to translate from one to the other. For Jung, the corresponding faculty in the human mind for myth making he called the archetypes, which he said are common to psychic activity in every culture in history. They manifest themselves in different ways in different cultures just as the language we learn depends on which culture we're born into. But if we compare them from culture to culture, we get the same kind of structure that we do for language. So we can talk about, Jung says, about a collective or shared or universal unconsciousness. For Jung, dreams are a manifestation of a culture's unconscious, and so dreams and myths overlap to a great extent. For him, myths are collective dreams, and dreams are an individual's myths. And that accounts for the possibility of a monomyth because it's all one grand story. 
of which every myth is simply a culturally deflected version. Now, Campbell wasn't a Jungian per se, but he made use of the theory of the collective unconscious to buttress his ideas of the monomyth. For Campbell, every myth is a cultural mask worn by the universal human psyche, a manifestation of Jungian archetypes. Another implication of Jung's theory for Campbell is that the journey taken by the hero is not a geographic or literal one, but it's rather a psychological journey. It's a quest not into the world out there, but into the world on, in here, specifically a quest into one's own unconscious. It's in the unconscious, Campbell says, that we meet the dragons and demons that we have to fight and slay. We meet the goddess and we have to become reconciled with our father. All of this is an internal thing. It happens within ourselves. The boon that one brings back from a Campbell quest is an enhanced awareness of oneself, making life richer, and also you, we bring back an enhanced understanding of how all psyches work so that we can bring back enlightenment both for the individual and for the community. If you're interested in, a, in a good, some good introductory material on this, and of course this is, material is far richer than I'm presenting it here, there's a really good couple of chapters in a book by Eva Thury and Margaret Devinney called Introduction to Mythology. If you look up the chapters on Freud and Ronk and Jung and Campbell, there's a lot of really good information and good bibliographies as well. We should note in passing that not only is the monomyth itself seriously contended, contested by some scholars, but so is the modern psychological orientation of the theory. Now, we've had occasion to cite Mircea Eliade frequently during this course. We will have occasion to cite him again. He has argued throughout his long career that myths should be understood as religious, not as psychological experience. Myths tell us, he says, how humans have apprehended the divine through history, not how the human psyche works. That's a dissenting view and a very powerful one, which needs to be at least mentioned. But back to the monomyth. We need a clearer idea of what it is since we'll be using it over the next lectures as an analytical tool anyway. It is still controversial. Not everybody agrees with it. Um, so after we finish our unit, you can decide for yourself whether you think it works or whether it even exists. But it is a great analytical tool. One other item um, before we launch into that, and that is in this and in subsequent lectures, we'll be treating the monomythic protagonist as male. And that's because most of our heroic myths come from patriarchal cultures. That fact was tempered a little bit by Jungians, for whom part of the unconscious of every male is his anima, his female side, while part of the unconscious of every female is the animus, her masculine side. So that for whichever gender, exploring one's own unconscious means in part getting in touch with a part of oneself that is the opposite gender. But, that having been said, even for Jungians, most analysis of myth has been from the male point of view. The hero is almost always male, and women serve as helpers, as guides, as temptresses, or as the goals of a hero's quest. We'll try to correct this imbalance slightly in lectures 27 and 28, where we take a look specifically at female heroes to consider how they look and in what ways they're different from the male hero. But for now, we have to recognize that the bias is built into the material. The myth, the, the, the monomyth that we're going to talk about here is a very simplified composite one. It comes from David Leeming, the Oxford Companion to World Mythology. We'll use this for our first lectures, and then when we get to lecture 25, we'll do a more complicated version in much more detail about how these monomyths work. According to Leeming, the hero usually begins life with a miraculous conception or birth. The Chinese hero Yu, we remember from lecture 10, was born from the body of his father three years after his father died. It may have even been turned into stone. The White River Sioux have a story about Rabbit Boy who's kicked into life from a clot of blood. Buddha is born from his mother's side after his mother dreams of a white elephant. There are many Native American stories of virgin births in which uh, a maiden eats an acorn or has the wind blow up her skirt or, or sunlight falls in her vulva. The point is, for Leeming, is that it suggests that every one of these heroes comes directly to us from out of eternity, directly from the cosmos, giving human beings, human nature, a second start with the birth of the hero. Once the, once the hero is born, he's immediately set upon by the guardians of the status quo, sometimes called the guardians of the gate, who don't want anything to change. In myths, 
usually kings or jealous fathers or even demons try to kill this child before he has a chance to grow up and change anything. Herod, we remember, tries to kill all male children under two years old to kill the king of the Jews the Magi have told him about. King Kamsa does the same to try to prevent the birth of Vishnu as Krishna in lecture 20, last, in our last lecture. Moses is sent off in a pitch line basket to prevent the Pharaoh from killing him. And many heroes like Oedipus are exposed on mountains as infants in hopes that animals will eat them and thus deflect the prophecies and the threat. The child proves that he's extraordinary even as a child and most hero myths have adventures of extraordinary things that children's do, children do. Krishna in his last, uh, in, his, in the incarnation we talked about last time, is set upon as a young man by many, many demons. One anoints her nipples with poison and then suckles him, trying to kill him. He sucks her dry and then destroys her without harming himself, suffering any harm. The boy who will become King Arthur pulls a sword out of the stone when he's about 15 years old. Theseus, as a child, removes a covering from his father's shoes and sword, proving that he is the son of King Aegeus. Jesus dazzles the scribes and Pharisees in the temple when he's 12 years old with his knowledge. Once the hero achieves manhood, he usually, there's usually a period of isolation, getting ready for the adventure. Moses spends time in the fields as a shepherd until Yahweh calls him in the burning bush. Um, once in the Ojibwe, story fasts for days in a lodge outside the village while waiting for the coming of the corn king. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan after fasting 40 days and nights. Buddha is tempted by the fiend Mara, the spirit of sensuality and self-serving while under the Bodhi tree waiting for enlightenment. Then comes the departure, leaving the old comfortable life behind to venture into a new place even if one does so reluctantly. Leeming points out Bilbo and Frodo of Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings to show how reluctant a hero might be, how reluctant one might be to leave the familiar and comfortable Hobbiton for the dangerous adventures ahead. Lots of heroes feel this way, and many heroes are warned by their cultures not to go on the heroic quest. In our next lecture, Gilgamesh is warned by everyone not to mess with the unknown, but to stay home and to be a happy king. Then comes the search for something, something lost, some specific object, some place for understanding, for enlightenment, whatever the goal of the quest is. Telemachus in the Odyssey sets out searching for his missing father. Jason sets out to find the golden fleets. The knights of the round table search for the holy grail. Buddha and Jesus seek enlightenment. And Moses sets out with his people to the promised land. On the way, the hero is going to meet guardians at every threshold, people who don't, creatures who don't want to let him cross, giants and dragons and monsters and demons and sorcerers and femme fatales, all of whom either try to destroy the hero or deflect him from his quest. Sometimes he has to even descend into the land of the dead, dying a kind of metaphoric death himself. And in the land of the dead, he confronts other kind of terrors which he has to overcome in order to finish his quest. When he returns, he brings back a boon for his people. He brings back corn, or the curing qualities of the grail, the Chinese land which is now redeemed from the flood and ready for agriculture. He brings back the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, the word of Allah brought back from the mountain by Muhammad, the enlightenment which is won by Buddha. Sometimes, as a kind of epilogue to his story, the hero then returns to the source of his vision to be reunited with the cosmos from which he has come in the first place. Jesus and Buddha ascend into heaven. King Arthur sails away to Avalon. Moses, Enoch, and Elijah are translated into heaven. All of these affirm the, the achievement of nirvana in the enlightenment or the kingdom of God, whatever it's called in the individual myth, and all of which, of course, can serve as metaphors for something else. We can illustrate, perhaps, the idea of the monomyth, the, the, the simplified version that we've looked at so far, with one example you probably already know, and this is the Greek myth of Heracles. Heracles was the son of Zeus by Alcmene, a mortal woman. Um, who, Zeus visited her in the shape of her husband. She thought she was sleeping with her husband. It turns out she's sleeping with uh, Zeus, and she gives birth to two children, one by her husband Amphitryon, one by Zeus. 
Um, so Heracles has that unusual conception of birth that a hero is supposed to have, and he's also half divine. In some versions of the story, Altmini, fearing the wrath of Hera, um, exposes the child herself outside the city walls, hoping it will just disappear. And so the guardian of the gate here turns out to be his mother rather than his father. That's not quite typical. He ful fulfills the extraordinary events, the extraordinary feats of, of strength in his youth by killing two giant serpents, which are sent by Hera to kill him in his, in his cradle. Her Heracles marries and has children. But Hera is always after him, and she sends him a fit of madness in which he kills his wife and children. He's overcome by remorse, and so he visits an oracle who sends him to his cousin Eurystheus, who's the king of Mycenae, a man who's half afraid of Heracles and who gives him all kinds of tasks designed to get him killed in the process. And here's where the twelve laborers come into the story. They're all impossible, and they're all performed. The last is to bring back from Hades Cerberus, the guard dog of the dead, to bring him back to earth, which Her Heracles actually does, fulfilling another part of the monomyth in his descent into the land of the dead. There are all kinds of other adventures, but eventually he remarries, and his second marriage turns out to be the cause of his death. Deonera, his second wife, is worried that Heracles might have fallen in love with a slave woman he has captured in battle. And so she gives him a special shirt with a special ointment on it, which was given to her by Nessus the centaur against just this eventuality. Nessus says, if you ever worry about your husband being unfaithful, anoint this shirt with this ointment, have him wear it, and he will be faithful. The background of this story is that Nessus gave the potion for the shirt to Heracles' wife. When he was dying of an arrow wound that was given him by Heracles, Nessus had been carrying Deonera across a river and in some way insulted her, and so Heracles kills Nessus. Nessus then gives this, this potion to uh, Deonera and says, if, if ever your husband's going to be unfaithful, um, use this. So the shirt turns out, of course, to be Nessus' revenge on Heracles. The shirt, with all of its poison, can't quite kill Heracles, but it just can torment him horribly. He makes his way home in great pain, only to find that Deonera, having discovered what she'd done by sending him the shirt with the potion on it, has already killed herself. Heracles has a funeral pyre made, and he climbs onto it, giving his famous bow to Philoctetes. That's the famous bow that will show up very, very famously in Homer's Iliad. After his death, after Heracles' death, Zeus is moved, and so even is the otherwise implacable Hera, and Heracles is given immortality. He's also given as his eternal wife, Hera's daughter, Hebe, and this becomes what Leeming called the epilogue to the monomyth, in which the hero achieves full union with the cosmic source of his being. But meanwhile, Heracles has become, can illustrate for us what a Greek culture hero looks like. He rids the world of monsters and clears the way for a safer, happier life for humans. And he also manages to fulfill most of the requirements of the monomyth, so that he is both a specific cultural hero, doing what he does for his culture, and at the same time can help us to illustrate what that monomyth might look like. Next time, we are going to begin a, th a three lecture series on three separate hero myths from three different parts of the world, from Mesopotamia, from Celtic England, and from Greece. In each one, we'll get a chance to further test out the idea of the monomyth to see how well it works in describing the, the, sto the stories that we deal with. And in each one, I think we'll have a chance to add another detail or two to this sort of composite, simplified version of the monomyth we're working with so far. Next time, we'll start with the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh.